Lord Jesus, as we get into your word, we ask that you enlighten our minds, open our hearts, and really bring us to a complete revelation of your glory and how much you despise grumbling and murmuring, Lord, and how much you love a people who trust you no matter what our minds and intellects and reasonings and emotions have to say, especially our flesh. And we ask now, Lord, that you would make us obedient to your word and let the scales fall off our eyes and let our ears become unplugged. Let us know that you are the Lord of both testaments and that we live under the covenant of your blood. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, Hebrews 12. The key scripture... The key scripture for this whole study is in Hebrews 12, verse 25. Hebrews is, is right now my favorite book. I have like the book of the month club in my life. I have my favorite book. Well, Hebrews is um, now my favorite book because I'm. It's really. It was a real hard book for me to understand, and it's suddenly opening up to my mind. Next, hopefully, God will open up Romans to me. <laughs> Okay, verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. There's a real principle in the New Testament, and it's opposite to what people think. People think the Old Testament is severe, you know. You know, you keep the law or die, you know. And the New Testament is, it's so easy, you know, it's just so easy to be a Christian, and it's so easy to follow Jesus and to keep the New Covenant. And the New Covenant is easier to keep. It's true that the New Covenant is easier for us to keep because instead of the Spirit resting upon us, the Spirit lives in us. In the Old Testament, whenever the Spirit did anything, it would come upon the people but never would it really live inside the people to keep the law. Now we've got a new law to keep, the law of love and the law of liberty. And we also have the Spirit to help us keep it, yes. But, according to Hebrews and according to Jesus, as we'll see in Matthew, if we disobey under the new covenant, the punishment's even worse. Let's look at this. Verse 25. See to it that you do not refuse him who is speaking. For if those did not escape when they refused him who warned them on earth, much less shall we escape who turn away from him who warns from heaven. Turn back two chapters, to chapter 10. Verse 28. Chapter 10, verse 28. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses, or... Let me paraphrase that for you. Anyone who has disobeyed under the old covenant dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. How much severer punishment do you think he will deserve who has trampled underfoot the Son of God, has regarded as unclean the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified, and has insulted the Spirit of grace? The key word here is by which he was, past tense, sanctified. That's an incredible... Well, that'll just destroy your theology right out the back door. You know, if you come from any kind of a, you know... I mean, most modern-day American Christian theologies wouldn't even allow for a sentence like, he was sanctified. <laughs> that means that now he isn't. You know, like you can lose your sanctification. Or... I won't even say it. I don't want to stand the hair up on the back of your neck. Verse 29, let's read this again. Verse 28, anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witness, if, witnesses. And we're going to go back and we're going to look in the Old Testament over some of the principles that people, that, that the things that made God the angriest. The things that made God the angriest. Now, this is a subject that, you know, if any of you were brought up under a, a real strict Christian home or Christian church or Christian theology, you're probably tired of hearing of hellfire and brimstone. And I'm not here to tell you about hellfire and brimstone. I'm here to tell you about the love of God. 
And the love of God also has a justice. And that justice is exact. But he gives us a spirit under the new covenant to keep our part of the covenant. It's almost like he's keeping it for us, but there is a partnership there between his spirit and our ability to, in our will, step out of the boat. And I have a, I have a really great expression of that. When Peter walked on the water, who did the walking? Who stepped out of the boat? Yeah. Who gave him the power to stay above water? Right. But there was a partnership between one, the willingness and the action of stepping out and walking and the power from God to stay above the water. And today, there's so many Christians that sit back and go, oh, you know, they, they kind of wait for Jesus to kind of levitate him out of the boat. You know, it, it's not going to work that way. You know, it's like people that say, I believe God for a job. I'm just going to sit here and wait for it to come to the door. No, you've got knocking on doors. If God says, I've got a job for you. Now, of course, there are times when God says, you study the word and I will get, uh, somebody will call. Now, that's the exception. Most of the time, God will say, you want to eat? Go to work. You know, do you want to, you want to have, you want to have grain? Sow some, you know. Plow, dig the furrows, break up the fallow ground, sow the seed, and then stand by with your hoe so you can get the weeds and cultivate. Maybe you even have to irrigate, depending on how dry the land is. Now, one more scripture out of the New Testament to tell about that if the Old Testament was severe and the punishment of the Old Testament was heavy, how much heavier is of a penalty is there when Christians take for granted the spirit of grace or the exact words as they trample underfoot Jesus, Son of God, regard as unclean the blood of the covenant by which we were, past tense, sanctified, and have insulted the spirit of grace or grieved the spirit. Okay, turn to Matthew. I think it's chapter 11. I've got it dog-eared here. I really get a pleasure out of teaching subjects and areas that are not usually taught. The reason being is because when I was first a Christian, I heard nothing but love, grace, forgiveness, and mercy. And those things are the weightier provisions of the law. Hallelujah. Those things, without love, mercy, hope, forgiveness, I'd be dead as a doornail. I wouldn't be able to stand. I'm not trying to teach you this stuff going, you better listen or God's going to get you. That's not where my heart's at. He is, as we'll even see Moses saying, slow to anger, full of loving kindness and compassion. And uh, look what Matthew says. Verse, chapter 11, verse 20. This is Jesus speaking, Matthew writing. Then he began to reproach the cities in which most of his miracles were done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! For if the miracles had occurred in Tyre and Sidon, which occurred in you, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. Nevertheless, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for Tyre and Sidon in the day of judgment than for you. And you, Capernaum, will, you, will not be exalted to heaven, will you? No, you shall descend to hell. For if the miracles that occurred in Sodom, which occurred in you, it would have remained to this day. Nevertheless, I say to you that it shall be more tolerable for the land of Sodom in the day of judgment than for you. Meaning, now, Leonard Ravenhill has a whole book called Sodom Had No Bible. And the meaning of that one sentence, I used to look at the title of that book going, what does that mean, Sodom Had No Bible? What, do you want to open up a Bible bookstore in Sodom? I don't understand this. And I finally figured it out. I was just preaching in Tulsa for two weeks. And suddenly God enlightened my eyes to what that sentence meant. And I said, you brood of vipers and snakes, Sodom, Sodom, Sodom had no Bible. And you've got one in every hotel room drawer and five on your, on your bookshelf. And you've got four gospel stations blaring the gospel 24 hours a day in modern music, country music, and funeral dirges. <laughs> You've got gospel preachers and evangelists and ministries coming out your, you know, your ears, and you've got porno shops and X-rated movies and, and, and all kinds of scum and all kinds of homosexuality undercover in the closet. 
I said, Sodom had no Bible and they were destroyed. And if God doesn't destroy you, he's going to have to apologize to the people of Sodom and Gomorrah. That's what Jesus says here. He says, look, I've been preaching the good news. I've been preaching salvation by faith in myself, he says. And you haven't repented. I have healed the sick. I have raised the dead. I have cast out demons. And you have not repented. If Sodom would have seen what you see, they would have all given up their homosexuality. They would have given up their, they would have given up their, their impurities and their greediness. But you haven't. You're worse than they are. What I'm saying is anyone who cannot obey under the new covenant is twice as bad as those who could not obey under the old covenant. Because the new covenant, he gives us his own spirit to help us obey. Much more patient. And if people won't obey under that, what can he do with such souls as those? For it will be more tolerable, he says, in the day of judgment for Sodom, Tyre, and Sidon than for you, you cities who have seen the gospel, who have seen miracles and have heard the good news preached. Okay. This is a prologue to the message. The reason I wanted to give you this stuff out of the New Testament is I wanted to show you in the Word of God that the Bible distinctly states that the Old Testament might have had a harsher requirement, but it had an easier judgment. The Old Covenant had a harsher requirement, but it had an easier judgment. Because it says in James, be not many teachers, knowing that we shall be judged with greater strictness. In another place, Jesus says, if you did something that was wrong and you knew it, you will receive many stripes. But if you did something worthy of many stripes and you didn't know it, you'll receive but few. Meaning, the more you learn, the more you sit in these classes and take notes, the more Bible books you read, the more teachers you hear, the more that you understand and comprehend, the more God requires of you in obedience. As Winky Prattney, our brother, says, knowledge equals responsibility. And we are all here. It says, be not many masters. Guess what you're all studying to be, folks? You're not learning all this stuff for your health. You're not learning all this stuff for your beauty. You're learning this stuff to spread it. A friend of mine once signed a letter don't keep the faith, spread it. <laughs> and it's pretty heavy because we're going to learn some things today that if you don't want to be accountable, you can you buy. Because you know? this is heavy stuff. Let's turn to Numbers. In the Old Testament. Chapter 11 of Numbers. Numbers is the fourth book in the Bible. It's part of the, I can't pronounce this word, Pentateuch. Anybody know any Hebrew here? It means the five books of Moses. I always, I, n I never liked these books except for Genesis. I always liked the flood and all the stuff there, you know. Um, I never liked these other books because I thought they were full of the law, but they're not just full of the law. They're full of some incredible principles. Incredible principles. Okay. You can title this subject Grumbling, Murmuring, and Complaining. Okay. Chapter 11 of Numbers. Okay, the first subject we're going to cover is the complaining of the flesh. You can put in parentheses after flesh, the appetites, comma, or desires. The complaining of the flesh, appetites, in parentheses, appetites, or desires. Each chapter here, in the next four or five chapters, except for one chapter of Levitical Law, has a different sort of murmuring. 
a different sort of complaining. See if you do not see yourself here as we go into this. This can be very humorous unless we take it seriously. <laughs> and a lot of times we cry, we laugh so we won't have to cry. You know, when I get nervous, I either laugh or cry. I usually laugh so I don't cry. I can't stand it, I start crying. Chapter 11. Now the people became like those who complain of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. And when the Lord heard it, his anger was kindled, and the fire of the Lord burned among them and consumed some of the outskirts of the, outskirts of the camp. The people therefore cried out to Moses, and Moses prayed to the Lord, and the fire died out. So the name of that place was called Taberah, which means burning, because the fire of the Lord burned among them. Now that's just one story. We're going to hear about five different cases. This is like a little... The reason, you know, the Bible is such an incredible book. It's thousands of years of history condensed into one book. You ever seen the rise and fall of the Roman Empire or the rise and fall of the Third Reich? You know, it's giant volumes. Here, we've got the New Testament. You know, minus, my con min minus my concordance at the back. Is this thick? This is the whole history of the early church, all the Gospels, all Christian theology. That thick. The Old Testament, which was a little bit coarser, <laughs> but which also has a lot of poetry involved in it and a lot, of, a lot of history that the New Testament doesn't have, is this thick. This is the whole history of a people. And all their doctrines, all their laws, all their poetry, all their theology. You ever seen the average theology book or a commentary? Yeah. Look at how concise God is. So here's, here's a little concise story. Moses is setting up the stage. He's not going to tell you. He, he wants to tell you these little, these three verses so that you don't think that God has got a short temper. These three verses tell what God's going through and what Moses is going through for quite a while. And the people were complaining of adversity in the hearing of the Lord. The Lord got angry, sent some fire, burned up the outskirts of the camp, cried to Moses. Moses said, please, God, stop it. They stopped it. God stopped it. Okay. God had to go through a lot of stuff. He had these people. Verse 4. And the rabble, the, the word rabble, what is it saying, King James? Anybody reading out of King James? The mixed multitude. Wow. Impure. Impure. Mixed is the opposite of pure. The rabble who were among them had greedy desires. <laughs> and also the sons of Israel wept again and said, Who will give us meat to eat? We remember the fish which we used to eat free in Egypt. The cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. What a breath they must have had. <laughs> Call it Egypt breath. But now our appetite and our breath is gone. There is nothing at all to look at except this manna. And Moses would go, what's the manna, right? Oh, I had to do that. Um, there's nothing, man, manna again. You know, they, they come out in the morning going, maybe he'll send us post toasties, you know. <laughs> Bacon and eggs from heaven, you know. Manna, manna omelets, fried manna, deep fried manna, refried manna, boiled manna, manna hot cakes. Manicotti. <laughs> Mana Sundays. Oh, man. Mana's coming out of our ears. We're tired of manna all the time. They forget they don't deserve nothing. God sent them out in the desert giving them free bread. They don't even have to work for it. They just pick it up. Wonder bread again. You know. Okay, you got an idea? It's wonder bread, right? <laughs> now it tells you a little bit about manna. The manna was like a coriander seed. Its appearance was like that of bedellium. The people would go about, gather it, grind it between two millstones, beat it in the mortar, or boil it in the pot, make cakes with it. You could probably sleep on it. And its taste was as the taste of cakes baked with oil. Okay? When the dew fell on the camp at night, the manna would fall with it. Now Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families. 
each man at the doorway of his tent, and the anger of the Lord was great was kindled greatly, and Moses was displeased. Now, here you're going to see one of the first results of the people of God complaining. It will make their elders' burdens too hard for them to bear. Here's one of the first results. It will make the people that are supposed to be overseeing them their burden too hard to bear and make them cry and even make them complain and even if they're not really watching out, these elders, these pastors, these teachers, these overseers, make them sin before the Lord. Now, there's no such thing as somebody making you sin, but there is such a thing as making it harder on people to be godly or making it harder on people, making it aggravating for people. The scripture for this, keep your finger in numbers, turn back to Hebrews, is in Hebrews 13. Verse 17, Hebrews 13, verse 17. This is the favorite scripture of all pastors and elders throughout the land. <laughs> Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they keep watch over your souls as those who will give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for who? For you. Let them do this with joy. Not with grief, for this would be unprofitable for you. Why will it be unprofitable for you? Because if you cause them grief, all of a sudden, their efficiency level goes from 10 down to 2. All of a sudden, they're pulling their hair out, trying to figure out how to please their sheep. All of a sudden, the bleeding of, bah, the bleeding of their sheep is coming into their ears, and they start getting, oh, what am I going to do? Now listen to Moses. Poor Moses. He only had 600,000 sheep, the largest church in history. Those were just the men, 600,000 men. He numbers them a couple chapters up. Now, uh, verse 11. So Moses said to the Lord, Why hast thou been so hard on thy servant? Why have I not found favor in thy sight that thou hast laid the burden of all this people on me? Was it I who conceived all this people? Was it I who brought them forth, that thou should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a nursing infant, to the land which thou didst swear to their fathers? In other words, he's saying they're all a bunch of babies. Do I have to, you know, change their diapers and wipe their noses as we travel through the desert? Now, listen to this, verse 13. Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep before me, saying, Give us meat that we may eat. I alone am not able to carry all this people because it is too burdensome for me. Now listen to this. So if thou art going to deal like this with me, please kill me at once. <laughs> if I have found favor in thy sight, do not let me see my wretchedness. Now, wretchedness here does not mean, he's not talking about his sin. He's talking about his wretched countenance, his grief. You know, when you, you know how when you're grieved, you feel wretched? He said, do not let me see my grief, my wretched feelings. Now, if anybody talks like this to God, they're either going to turn into Moses dust quickly or they better have a good relationship with God. See, any of the other people that would have talked like God, this guy would have went, you know, you know. But Moses had a face-to-face -face relationship with God, as we'll see in chapter 12. And I'm telling you something. God does not directly rebuke Moses for his complaining. Because Moses' walk with the Lord is so tight. He doesn't directly rebuke him. In fact, he answers his prayer and starts giving him elders. Let's see what happens. Now, he's bringing two complaints to God. Complaint number one. This job is too big for me. It's too burdensome for me. And God, instead of God going, listen, Moses, I'll make you able, God goes, yeah, I know what you mean. <laughs> the, you really do have a, boy, these people are really something. Moses, you know what I'm going to do? Verse 16, the Lord therefore said to Moses, gather for me 70 elders, 70 men from the elders of Israel. Here's the qualification. Whom you know to be already the elders of the people. Who already have the marks, the qualifications, and 
the ability and the respect of the people. Before you say these are elders, you know, before in, in any ministry, I'll raise up an elder or in, in, you know, any other ministry, they already have to have the godliness and the respect, the godliness from God and the respect of the people. People already respect them because of their walk with the Lord. You don't just go, all right, here's an elder, respect him. You know. So this is really great. Whom you know to be the elders of the people and their officers, bring them to the tent of the meeting and let them take their stand with you there. Then I will come down and speak with you there and I will take of the spirit who is upon you and I will scatter or put him upon them and they shall bear the burden of the people with you so that you shall not bear it alone. Okay, that's the answer number one. Sounds like a pretty good idea. Hey, listen. Listen, Moses. Can't bear it? Let's well, spread it out. <laughs> sounds, sounds like God's just blessing him for his complaining, doesn't it? Sounds like God, but you know, about four or five chapters up, there's a little... We're not going to read it right now. We're going to get into that in the next session. In verse chapter 16, you can put a little thing in your Bible or, or in your notes to turn to chapter 16 and you will see the results of God spreading the burden out to 70 other men. It's called, quote, the rebellion of Korah. It's only five chapters on. Moses says, I can't handle it. Now look, Moses could have prayed this prayer. God, this is hard, but please make me able. Now God, God might have said, okay, I'm going to make you able by giving you helpers and not have allowed the rebellion of Korah to happen. But, but since there's two ways to pray, there is two ways to pray and get the same physical results. God, please take care of our needs, my wife and children, the roof's falling in, the, the, you know, the rain's coming down into the house. Please, God says, okay, brings in the funds. You know, the other way to pray, God, what are you doing this stuff for? It's your fault. You know, and you come at God with this finger pointed, you know. Was it I who brought this people? Did I conceive? You know, who, you know, what do you think I am? Be careful how you pray. For God may answer your prayer. And you may find out you didn't want it answered. You know, God, if you want me to get married, I'll take anybody you've got, no matter how ugly I might think she is, how untalented I might think she is. If you say this is your God, I'll do it. And you know what? I'm willing to never get married at all. God blesses that attitude. God, I want a wife. Oh, God, give me a wife. I can't stand not having a wife, and I want one pretty and talented and person. I want oh, God might give you the prettiest, most talented, rebellious witch in the world. <laughs> Be careful how you pray. I have seen people pray for that kind of a wife and get the most backbiting, gossiping, rebellious, non-submitting women. And still God would work it out. God loves us. But as he loves us, he teaches us. And boy, have I gotten lessons that I wouldn't trade in for 40 years in seminary. And I sure wish it didn't have to be so hard. But I'm glad afterwards that it was. Be careful how you pray. Make sure it's with the right motives for whose glory. Amen. Okay, now the answer to part number two of Moses' complaining prayer. <laughs> Verse 18. And say to the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow you shall eat meat. <laughs> And for you, for you have wept in the ears of the Lord, saying, Oh, that someone would give us meat to eat, for we were well off in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. Now I can hear everybody going, Yay, Lord! Hey, this pays off. We had to complain more often. <laughs> Verse 19. You shall eat not one day, nor two days, nor five days, nor ten days, nor twenty, but a whole month until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you. You want meat? I'll give you meat. Buckets and buckets of Colonel Sanders fried quail. 
because you have rejected the Lord who is among you and have wept before him saying why did we ever leave Egypt Egypt in Revelation the spiritual Egypt is considered the world Babylon they call the world the spirit of the world either Babylon or spiritual Egypt and I'm working on a song right now it goes so you wanna go back to Egypt where it's warm and secure are you sorry you bought that one-way ticket when you thought you were so sure? You want to live in the land of promise, but now it's getting too hard. Are you sorry you're out here in the desert instead of your own backyard? So that's, that's part of what I'm working on. And there's a whole thing about Christians. They pray the sinner's prayer, which you can find in 3 Corinthians. And they go, Lord... The Old Testament's in Hezekiah. Lord, come into my heart. Be my Savior. Da -da 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 Christian, instant Christian. Yes, now I'm a Christian, you know. Three or four weeks later, the sun comes out. <laughs> God, I thought there were blessings in this. I thought this would be a happy, joyful experience. Peace that passes understanding. It's passing understanding. It's passing all notice. I don't even see it. <laughs> Where's my peace? Ah, you know, I, I wasn't this trialed in the world, tested in the world. I want to go back to the world. I want to go you know, smoke some dope. I want to go back and have some fun when it wasn't so hard. You know, and I've heard so many people say this to me. It wasn't like this before I prayed to receive Jesus. You want to go back? These people, you're going to hear it chapter after chapter after chapter. I want to go back to Egypt. I want to go back to Egypt. Boy, if I were Moses, I don't know where he got his patience. Think about Jesus. The night before he dies on the cross, before he's delivered up, the disciples are really worried and grieved. They're really concerned. I'm the greatest in the kingdom. Oh, yeah, well, I'm the greatest in the kingdom. Now, if I would have been Jesus, I would have gone out and looked for 12 new disciples. <laughs> Instead, he takes a towel and a basin of water and washes their feet and explains to them lovingly, patiently, this is not the way. The Gentiles, they lord it over one, uh, one, over one another. They give commands to one another. But it's not so with you. You're to be the greatest among you should be the greatest head servant of the rest. You want to be great? Get down low. Me, I would have said, Peter, James, John, out, out, goodbye. I've had it three years. I'm going to die tomorrow. Forget it. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God for his patience. I wouldn't have given them meat to eat. Ugh. God answers their prayer. Be careful for how you pray. <laughs> now look at Moses. Moses is a man of faith here. Moses is the greatest man in this time. And here's the man of faith. But Moses said, The people among whom I am are 600,000 on foot, yet thou hast said, I will give them meat in order that they may eat for a whole month. Should flocks and herds be slaughtered for them to be sufficient for them? Or should all the fish of the sea be gathered together for them to be sufficient for them? And the Lord said to Moses, is the Lord's power limited, or is the Lord's hand short? Now you shall see whether my word will come true or not, for you are not. Okay, I said before it was 600,000 men, now it's 600,000 people. All right. Moses, the man of faith. Where are you going to get meat, Lord? I mean, you know, we don't have any, we don't have any uh, restaurants out here. There's no chains of McDonald's, nothing. <laughs> What are we going to do? A lot of faith Moses had. Verse 24. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord. Okay, we're going to pass over this down to um, verse 31. He, he picks the 70 men out, and there's not enough time to go over that. Verse 31. Now we're going to go into part two of his prayer and how God answers it and how the people respond to the answer. Now there went forth a wind from the Lord, and it brought quail from the sea, and let them fall beside the camp, about a day's journey on this side and a day's journey on the other side, all around the camp. Now remember, 600,000 people, that's like uh, 
I don't know, Fort Worth, Texas or something, you know, I mean, there's a lot of people there. It would take you a day to walk through the camp. Now the quail, the quail fell a full day's journey on all sides around the camp. About two cubits deep on the surface of the ground. A cubit is 18 inches. It was three feet deep full of birds for a day's walk on the outskirts of the camp. Quail City. <laughs> Not to mention the other, you know, the other things that quail bring. It must have been quite an answer to prayer. <sighs> All right? Three feet deep on the surface of the ground. And the people, now look at the people. They've had manna till they can't stand it anymore. And the people spent all day and all night and all the next day gathering the quail. He who gathered the least amount gathered ten homers. And on the side in your footnotes, you will see that one homer equals ten bushels. That means the person who gathered the least amount of quail gathered a hundred... Oh, I'm sorry, it's eleven bushels. A homer is eleven bushels. A hundred and ten bushels. Oh, you know what a bushel basket is? Full of quail. You know, quail are only about this big. Imagine each... A hundred and ten, the person who gathered the least amount gathered 110 bushels. Now here they have quail, they don't have to go out and gather, they're, you know, they're going to fly away. <laughs> God's people, flesh personified. Now, verse 33, while the meat was still between their teeth, before it was even chewed, the anger of the Lord was kindled against the people, and the Lord struck the people with a severe plague. Why? You're going to see in the next verse, verse 34. So the name of that place was called Kibroth Hadava, because there they buried the people who had been greedy. And the name of the place actually means the graves of greediness. The name of the place where they camped is called the graves of greediness. God sent a plague because, look, you asked for meat. Now do you have to stay up all day, all night, and all the next day gathering it? Don't you trust me? Didn't you see what I just brought? No trust, no faith. It's just like this. You're praying for money. Say you're praying for $100 to meet your expenses at school. And the Lord sends in $300. And you're going, wow, I don't have to work next month or the month. Now, God brought it for one reason, to meet your need and to give you the blessing of sharing it with somebody else or for something else. But if God tells you to put it in the bank and wait, that's fine. But most of the time, he doesn't say things like that. Most of the time, he says, take what you need. You know, buy the little thing you've been looking forward to getting and give the rest to a ministry or the poor or something else. Get rid of it while it's in your hand. A lot of times the Lord says this to me. God brought more than they'd ever need. When he brings you more than you need, do you stick it in your pocket and go, now I, well, I've been praying for money so long, I don't even have to pray for money the next three weeks. Hallelujah, I can play basketball instead of praying now. <laughs> Glory. Now I can, you know, read that novel I've been waiting to read, you know. Instead of spending all those hours on my knees praying for these funds to come in, I've got it. Uh-oh. There's a little principle that Laura showed me, and that is God sometimes stops writing the checks so that you remember who writes them. God sometimes stops the funds coming in so that you remember where they come from. Now here, he gives them quail, an overabundance, in answer to their fleshy prayer. And then the insult to injury of the people, no praise, no thanksgiving, no trust, no faith, but greed. And it was too much for God to handle. It was too much. It wasn't that God didn't have enough patience. It was that I'm answering your prayer, even the prayer of your flesh. And now you're being greedy. That was it. 
Many, many people die of a plague. Okay. And we're going to very quickly cover chapter 12. Okay. This is called the complaint of... I can't think of the word here. I didn't write it down. It's the complaint of those who are close to you, um, of relatives or friends. You can write down any way you want to. It's the complaint of acquaintances and relatives and people who are related to you because God is blessing you instead of them. And they're part of the same family. They're as good as you are. They came from the same mother and father. They have the same training. It's jealousy of a, a sibling, but it's even beyond that. It can go for f close friends, close brothers in the Lord, close sisters, mothers, children. And in the Lord, it's the same thing. God puts a blessing upon you. And the person you came into the ministry with, the person you came to school with, sees you getting raised up into this position, and people are saying, what a great Christian you are. And your friend is going, well, I led him to the Lord. <laughs> I, I brought him to this school. How come he gets to be pancake monitor? <laughs> you know what I'm talking about? Let's go this, through this quickly. We only have a few minutes left. Then Miriam and Aaron spoke against Moses because of the Cushite woman who he had married. Okay, they're just looking for an excuse. Cushite woman was a non-Jew whom apparently Moses was a praying man. I'm sure God gave him the God gave him the go ahead, but they were judging him and they didn't they didn't care less. They were just looking for an opportunity to judge by their next statement. And they said, "Has the Lord indeed spoken only through Moses? Has he not spoken through us as well?" Look at the next three words. Four, well, one, two, three, four, five words. And the Lord heard it. How come we can all be such dumbo sometimes to think the Lord's not listening to our complaints? I don't even know why God had to bother putting that in there, but it's so pertinent and it's so profound, those five words. Of course the Lord heard it. The Lord's ears are everywhere. Nobody in their right mind that was in any religion, from Hinduism to Moslemism to <laughs> um, you know, any Eastern philosophy, of course God hears everything. He has the all-seeing ears. <laughs> Excuse me, it's early. The all-hearing ears and the all-seeing eyes. The Lord heard it. Now, they were just using an excuse. You know, a lot of times, people will not like the way my hair is combed because they, they're jealous. You know, you know how when you, you don't like somebody and all of a sudden the way they crunch their granola in the morning gets to you? you know, the way they're digging into their pancake? And all of a sudden they just look like barbarians to you. you know? And it's not because they're doing anything wrong, it's because you're jealous. Or bitter. Now look at verse 3. Now the man Moses was very humble, more than any man who was on the face of the earth. Guess who wrote that sentence? You've got to be humble to be able to write that. And still let God, the head editor of the Bible, let it get in. He's the editor-in-chief, right? Moses comes with his manuscripts. And God does not X that out. Yeah, you are the most humble guy in the world. You know, only the truest... Only true humility could say, only Paul could say, I am boasting, and it's not profitable, but it's necessary. I am an apostle, and I've done this, 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 and this. Only true humility could ever give an account of itself for some good reason. Paul had to give an account of himself because the people were putting him down, and there was nobody else to give, to give Paul the, the, uh, the credence and the credentials. And Moses here had to put in I was blameless in this thing. I was humble. I was not boasting. I was not being proud. In fact, I was the humblest guy that you ever met. Now, sometimes we can have false humility and we can become proud of being humble. I was going to write a song once. Oh, I'm so proud of being humble. You know, <laughs> that'd make a great country song. Um, <laughs> Here he is, the humblest man in all the world, saying he's the humblest man in all the world, and God says, yes, you are the humblest man in all the world. What a blessing. 
I wish God would, you know, when, when it, you know, well, I'm glad he doesn't. When I say, well, I'm pretty getting humble, God goes, no, you're not. You know, God says to Moses, yeah, you are. Verse 4, and suddenly the Lord said to Moses and Aaron and to Miriam, you three come out to the tent of meeting. Now, this is just like a dad. You three kids, come here, I want to talk to you. <laughs> right? Kids are all fighting amongst themselves. Kids, come here, daddy wants to talk to you. So the three of them came out. You can see them, they're kind of going. Yeah, yeah dad. Right? Then the Lord came down in a pillar of cloud and stood at the doorway of the tent, and he came and he called Aaron and Miriam when they had both come forward. He said, How would you like for God himself to come down and speak in an audible voice in a visible cloud to take care of your sibling rivalries? You wouldn't have anybody to appeal to after that, would you? Well, I'm going to the pastor. I'm going to the church board. You know, God comes on himself and takes care of it. He said, Hear now my words. Is there a prophet among you? I, the Lord, shall make myself known to him in a vision. I shall speak with that prophet in a dream. Not so with my servant Moses. In other words, he's going, hey, look, do you respect the prophets? I'll speak to them in visions, dreams. Not with Moses. He is faithful in all my household. With him I speak mouth to mouth, face to face. Can you imagine that? I don't appear in a dream. I don't speak in a vision. Him and I just take a walk in the woods and we have a wrap. We talk together. Even openly, not in dark sayings or parables. I don't, you know, give him these riddles to figure out. And he beholds the form of the Lord. Why then were you not afraid to speak against my servant, against Moses? So the anger of the Lord burned against them and he departed. And when the cloud had withdrawn from over the tent, behold, Miriam was leprous, as white as snow. And Aaron turned toward his sister Miriam, and behold, she was a leper. That's quite a spanking, isn't it? Then Aaron said to Moses, Oh, my Lord! <laughs> I don't care who you married. Now, I beg you, do not account this sin to us in which we have acted foolishly and in which we have sinned. Oh, do not let her be like one dead whose flesh is half eaten away when he comes from his mother's womb. And Moses cried out to the Lord, saying, Oh, God, heal her, I pray. But the Lord said to Moses, Now that is called... A prayer for someone because of personal attachment. Heal her, Lord. She's my sister. The Lord says, if her father had but spit in her face. Now, let me explain that real quick. In Jewish law, if you had something against somebody legally, like if there's a whole story in Deuteronomy, and you can find it in, uh, you can look at it later. You can find it in uh, Deuteronomy 25.9. If a woman husband died and he had no children, she would have to marry her brother, her, his brother. His brother would have to marry her so they could have children to raise up his name. You, you've all heard of that, right? But if he refused to marry her, she could go to the elders of the city. And if the elders of the city couldn't talk sense to him, she would go and take his sandal away and spit in his face. And it was Jewish reproach. That's why they all spat in the face of Jesus. Behold, they cursed and mocked and spat at me, it says in, in Isaiah 53. Okay, so it says, if her father had but spit in her face, why would her father spit in her face? One, for fornication or adultery. Two, because of disobedience. In fact, under Jewish law, if the child was disobedient and was of the age of accountability after 13, they could stone him to death outside the camp if the parents brought him before the elders. So if her father had even just spit in her face, would she not bear her shame for seven days? Let her at least be shut up for seven days outside the camp, and afterwards she may be received again. So Miriam was shut up outside the camp for seven days. The people did not move on until Miriam was received again. Afterwards, however, the people moved out from Hazaroth and camped in the wilderness of Paran. Okay. These are two areas. One, the first one we covered was the complaint of the flesh. The next one is the complaint of closeness. The complaint or jealousy of closeness. Jealousy of closeness. Somebody, a close relative, a close friend, a close, a close uh, brother or sister that you're jealous of. And that's a complaint. Bless Jesus. Any, is there any questions on this? So fully covered, no questions. Yes, we.
Why was Miriam punished and not Aaron? Well, um, I don't know why, but I think Aaron was punished because he loved his sister, too. They were close family. And uh, you saw that Aaron saw it and went and made intercession for his sister. And two, um, because not only was it another person coming and judging Moses' authority, but it was his own sister and a woman. And she was showing no respect. Doesn't God speak through me too? So it was even more of a reproach that it was a woman who could not hold office at all, coming and saying, I'm holy too, Moses. You know, I'm from the Moses family too, you know. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah, did you just go over about that spitting in the face and all thing? Um, well, I don't know if we have time for that, uh, but just, it was a Jewish custom given in the law for showing that you had righteously been um, uh, offended. In other words, you were clean and pure, and you were offended by someone who was not clean and pure. And so the way to show that is you spat, spat in your face. Um, it definitely is not the cleanest way of showing your displeasure with somebody. Um, no, I wouldn't suggest it. But it was under, it was given in Jewish law as a way for showing that you had been degraded and you had been, um, you know, put down by somebody. Anyone else? Okay, in the, in the next thing that we're going to cover, um, which will, which will be after a break, we'll be covering the rebellion of people that are given a task 